this. So welcome everybody. Today's class is the introduction to SQL. My name is Ben Winjum and I'm a staff member at the Institute for Digital Research and Education. Uh, so this morning, uh, as an overview of what we're going to be um, working with this morning, I'm going to first give kind of a brief overview of um, SQL and databases. Then we'll dive right into some um, examples where we'll execute SQL queries and interact with a very simple database so that you can gain familiarity with um, what SQL sets out to do. And we're going to do this at the command line. Um, so just at the console, this is going to be a very simple environment, um, which is a little more straightforward to see exactly what it is that we're doing. Then I'll give a few more details about relational database management systems. Um, this is what SQL sets out to interact with. And following that, we'll um, do a couple more sophisticated SQL queries utilizing relations, um, which is where this term uh, relational database management systems comes in. And we'll do this with the GUI. So I emailed you beforehand about downloading dBeaver. dBeaver is a graphical user interface um, application that we can use to interact with databases and execute SQL queries. So we'll use that application second. Um, and then if time permits, at the end, I'll talk about using SQL with other languages for analysis. Um, I'll specifically, I'll show how to combine SQL with Python um, to do some more sophisticated data analysis and plotting while it's still interacting with SQL. So first of all, what is SQL? Probably if you're joining this class, you do have some sense of what SQL is. Um, SQL or SQL is structured query language. And it's used to allow you to create and modify databases and access the information inside of them. So um, this is a programming language. Um, it's a, a programming language that more specifically allows you to interact with relational database management systems. So I'll come to specifically what relational database management systems are um, in just a little bit later. But first, just a little motivation for um, why SQL is important. Um, I'm sure that many of you recognize um, these logos. Perhaps you have subscriptions to a variety of online movie and TV streaming services, Hulu and Netflix and Disney Plus and a wide variety of additional services um, have to keep a list of the products that they have, the shows or the movies. They have to keep um, documentation of who their customers are, how their customers pay them, what their preferences are. And then they also try and offer recommendations. And they try and do this in a relatively instantaneous way. So say I log on to Netflix. As soon as I log on to Netflix, it recognizes me. It keep, uh, I'm able to retrieve what my information is. I can change my information. It's going to recommend new movies and shows that I might like to watch based on what my previous viewing history is. And I can look up what my previous shows are that I've looked at you know, in the last day or even in the last couple years. Um, and these services have um, millions of users. They deal with a high volume of traffic. Um, and you really need ready access to a lot of information um, in order to efficiently operate these companies. I'm sure you also recognize some of these. Uh, E-commerce is a very um, profitable business. Uh, eBay, Amazon, and Rakuten are some of the um, largest companies in this space. They also have to keep lists of products, um, specifically products that users are purchasing through the online market. They keep track of user preferences, also user purchases, and they also try and make recommendations to you based on what your previous purchase history is. For social media, um, 
these also have millions of users. This is the logo for Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, many millions of users, and they have to keep track of the connections between different users, um, as well as user information and um, any posts or multimedia that the users have posted on their site. This has to be um, very quickly retrieved if users ask for them. And you have to be able to coordinate, for example, showing me what, what it is that my friends post um, and keeping me from seeing information that others might want to be private or that, um, say, other people have posted who are not my friends. Um, so there's, there's a, um, a very large web of interconnections that they have to keep track of. Sports is another big one in the database space. Um, there are a lot of statistics, um, uh, say for baseball or football or basketball, um, any number of different sports. Um, you keep track of players, games, brackets, predictions, um, what's happening with the players and um, for brackets like, or for, for um, services like fantasy football or um, March Madness, there's also uh, betting involved. The people try and keep track of who their favorite players are, what their history of the games is, and, and all these sorts of things. Um, finance is a very important usage of data. Um, there are quite a large number of uh, investment options that you have to keep track of all of the different funds that are available. Um, Certainly many millions and billions of dollars are invested in this. There's a lot of data analysis going on trying to predict the movement of various investments, um, various portfolios, and just say money that you store in a bank. Um, um, this has to do deal with a very high volume of traffic um, and banks want to be sure that they're properly keeping track of all of the transactions that occur. Finally, I mentioned weather. So weather produces a very high volume of data, um, many petabytes per day, I believe, just trying to keep track of all of the weather patterns over um, you know, very small regions across the entire planet, as well as keeping track of historical data, um, trying to feed the data into models. And of course, you want to retrieve the data when you try and make instantaneous or short-term or long-term predictions. Um, for local regions and feed that into weather reports. Healthcare is another big user of databases. I think this is the final one we'll talk about, but certainly it's very important. Um, this is just a graphic showing you an example of some databases, but it gives you a feeling for some of the different things in healthcare that require storing um, data in databases. Um, there's a large volume of patient information that has to be kept track of um, and in particular has to be kept secure. So um, data in this environment, there, there are regulations and issues regarding um, security and compliance. Um, you keep track of patient information, um, doctor information, healthcare and insurance information you have to make sure that all of this information is coordinated properly um, and retrievable. And there's a large volume of information that's being generated in research. Um, some of you perhaps interact with genomics research um, or other high volumes of data coming out that's intended to be able to predict things related to medicine and treatment. So all of the systems that I've mentioned benefit from databases and um, there are common usage patterns. All of them uh, require keeping track of lots of data. Um, you know, so this isn't data that you can just short, store on a spreadsheet with um, a couple thousand rows. These have to keep track of um, millions of rows of data. Uh, the data is required to be frequently updated you might have a high volume, say you get um, thousands of hits to a web page per second. Um, you have to frequently keep track of your data. 
you have to be able to modify the data in different places um, simultaneously. So whereas you might share a spreadsheet with, with your colleagues and both make changes to it, in this case, you have, say, th thousands of users accessing your database um, and all trying to change it at the same time. So you, sh you share the data among a lot of people, you simultaneously change it. Um, and in, in a lot of these cases, you make rapid queries as to what's in the database without really doing a whole lot of analysis. So Netflix say I have to keep track of um, information so that I can show it to users who log into the website. Um, but except for making recommendations, the data that's put out through the website um, isn't necessarily intended to make users aware of analysis that's being done on the data. It just makes data available to them. So there are some basic database considerations um, that are hinted at by these patterns. And so one term that you'll come across if you um, delve further into databases is the acronym ACID. And so um, this stands for atomicity, uh, consistency, isolation, and durability. So to talk about these, uh, I'll just kind of give a very, um, a very general case of why these issues are important for databases. So say, say we have one person, Al, who has a very healthy amount of money in the bank, but he has a friend, Joe, who's unfortunately um, way overspent his account and he has a negative balance. And they wanna use the bank to transfer money from this, the savings account that Al has into Joe's account um, so that his balance can return to zero. To do that, um, Al, say, contacts the bank that he's going to make a $15,000 transfer to Joe. Um, so ideally, Al is, Al's account is going to get deducted by $15,000. Joe's is going to get um, increased by $15,000. So he comes back to a zero balance. And then the bank itself might have you know, things it has to keep track of about transactions. So, Say in this case, um, since it's a sizable transfer, say the bank wants to log it to an auditing system in case they get audited by the IRS. Um, so the bank has to keep track of the transaction and they have to log it into an external system. So in the ideal case, um, the information that the bank stores, it keeps track of how much Al has in his account, it keeps track of how much Joe has in his account, and it keeps track of the, the logs that are relevant to the IRS. In the ideal case, Al's um, balance is decreased by 15,000, and Joe's is increased by 15,000, and the information is successfully logged to the IRS. And everybody ends up happy in this case. Um, so let, let's start over and consider some of the things that might go wrong with this scenario. Um, if the bank is maintaining its information um, in a non-ideal way, say that in the process of transferring the money from Al to Joe, a different investor comes in at the same time and makes a simultaneous late deposit of only $2. But the deposit is made at the same time that the transaction is being processed between Al and Joe. Um, say, say that it occurs almost at the same time that the money has been transferred out of Al and into Joe's account, but the ledger record gets overwritten before it can update Al's account. In this case, Al gets very happy because um, the transaction is overwritten and um, the, the balance is not taken out of Al's account before it's deposited into Joe's. In this case, the customers aren't unhappy, but the bank gets upset because it's, it's essentially lost $15,000 of its own money. This illustrates the concept of atomic. So uh, with atomicity, all results of a transaction have to be committed or the th whole thing is rolled back. So what that means is that if the transaction isn't successful, if Al's balance isn't decreased, 
during this transaction, the bank says that the transaction is um, invalid and it rolls the whole thing back to the initial state. All right, so let's, let's start again at the beginning and consider our initial case. Um, there's another thing that can potentially go wrong. So say that the transaction happens okay, but that the logs for recording the IRS relevant transactions are offline when this happens. So the log isn't, isn't ever written um, to the log. In this case, everything happens okay with the balances for Al and Joe, um, and technically for the balance in the bank, but the bank gets a little antsy because it hasn't properly updated its logs. In a case like this, there's something that's, um, the integrity of the transaction has been violated. So when, with consistency, um, if any integrity constraints can't be satisfied, then you also abort the transaction. Okay, so not, now for our third case. Let's start at the beginning again. <clears throat> so in the process of these transactions taking place, the bank doesn't necessarily want to show Al or Joe that the transaction is taking place in the middle of the transaction because if the transaction has to be aborted, it doesn't want Joe and Al to, to wonder what's happening to their um, bank accounts. So ideally the bank doesn't want to let Al or Joe see modified balances until the transaction has actually been finished successfully. This is what's termed isolation. So the results of a transaction are invisible until it's completed. And then finally, the D in ACID. Say that the bank does successfully record the $15,000 transaction and it logs successfully to its auditing system. So everybody's happy at the end. And then right after the transaction occurs, Lightning strikes and a power surge crashes the bank's computers. So in this case, um, what you want to have is that the results of the transaction survive any failures. Um, this is to maintain the integrity of the data in the database. So we have atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these are key concepts um, to keep in track and you'll often hear uh, asset compliant um, database management systems. So with, when you consider databases, um, these considerations say are um, constrain the system that you're developing more so than say um, simple files that you might interact with <clears throat> to keep track of data. In addition to being asset compliant, databases also wanna be fast. So in database development and research, there's a lot of heady math um, dealing with um, how to properly store uh, and manipulate data. Um, this can get very theoretical. One of the innovations in developing database systems was the use of a declarative language, which is what we'll be talking about today, SQL. So I'm not sure how familiar um, most of you are with other programming languages. Um, perhaps um, many of you have heard of languages like Python, C++, Java, Fortran. There are a whole variety of languages that are called imperative languages, where you basically you say to the computer, computer, here is how I want you to change your state. And you do this, say, by, <clears throat> in Fortran, you might give us specific sequence of steps to the computer, say that you want it to do in order to track the motion of a particle in space, or say you want to add two plus two. Um, you tell the computer in very specific terms how it is that you want to solve your problem. And the computer program that you specify, the, the, lang the language that you talk to the computer in um, is an imperative language. A language like SQL is, is different. It's called a declarative query language. So with SQL, you tell the computer, I want data that meets the following criteria. And SQL talks to um, the RDBMS. This is the Relational Database Management System. 
So the, the commands that you give to SQL um, are more declarative and they're like questions where you, um, you specify to the computer the data that it is that you want to retrieve, say. And it's up to the database management system to figure out um, what the best way is to store the data. It has something called a query planner, which it uses to figure out how it's going to satisfy the SQL query that you've given to it. Um, but the SQL queries by themselves are relatively simple compared to what's happening underneath the hood. So I mentioned um, ACID um, and this kind of relational algebra, but really to start working with databases and to start working with SQL this morning, all you really need to know to start is a relational database is like a really big spreadsheet that several people can update simultaneously. Um, and that's, for the most part, very um, adequate for you to get started. So the database, and you'll see this when we start interacting with the databases, each, each table in a database is like a spreadsheet. So databases are collections of things called tables. And these tables have rows and columns, just like you would see in a spreadsheet. Unlike spreadsheets, the columns do have a definite data type. Um, and the rows aren't ordered. And so this is because you want the database management system to control how it um, stores the data and how, how it responds to queries against the data. But the rows can have a unique identifier. And with a unique identifier, you can use, you can refer to rows and other tables by this identifier. <clears throat> so this allows you to have tables that have relations between them which is where you get your relational algebra. So to start, we'll start with some very simple tables. Um, we won't start with large databases by any sense. Um, but say, say that we consider this to be our database. And our database has two tables. It has one table which stores student information and one table that stores um, class information. So it's very simple. It just has the student name um, it has the particular class that they're enrolled in, and it has the class title. So you can see what the relation is between these two tables. You can use the class ID of a student to look up what class it is that they're enrolled in. So Dora and Mandu are enrolled in film. Daniel and Lana are enrolled in economics. Um, ben is enrolled in something that doesn't exist because something got messed up, um, and physics doesn't have any enrolled students. We'll, we'll come back a little later to, to these kind of outliers, but um, for the moment, this is sufficient to get us started. So now, now I've given my introduction and we're going to dive <clears throat> right into kind of an interactive example. So for those of you who have already logged in um, to the Jupyter Hub, I, I want you to go to that link. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to share. <clears throat> well, let me see. Actually, I'm just going to share my same. Sorry, just give me a second. So the, the website, for those of you who haven't, um, haven't accessed it yet, this is the GitHub repository where I've made all of my materials available. Um, on this are specific files that we'll be interacting with. But for the moment, for those of you who haven't done it, scroll down to the bottom. There's a link where you can launch into a Jupyter Hub, which is <coughs> Um, maintained by us here at UCLA and IDRI. If you click on this link, it will clone the materials into an account that you have um, on the Jupyter Hub that's associated with your UCLA account. 
for those of you who um, don't necessarily have a UCA login, you can also click on this launch binder link and that will take you um, to a different site where you can interact with Jupyter as well. Um, the, the slides, there's a question about where the slides are. The slides are the slides for introduction, introduction to SQL. So I'm gonna click on the launch into Jupyter Hub. This will take you um, specifically into Jupyter Lab. Ben, your um, share screen is still on the Google Slides. Oh, thank you. Um, does this look better? Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so for any of you who weren't following the links that I was pointing at, um, you're welcome to type something into the, yeah, kind of go back a step, sure. So um, the address is github.com slash Benjamin slash intro, uh, Idri intro to SQL. Um, so uh, that takes you to the web page for GitHub repository where I've stored files um, that you can download and files that will be um, kind of cloning into an account on the Jupyter Hub. The slides are this, this file, slides for introduction to SQL. That's a PDF file. You can actually click on this right on the web page and open it up in your web browser. Down at the bottom are the links that I was mentioning. This link is for <coughs> cloning the materials to the Jupyter Hub. You need a UCLA authentication in order to um, follow through with this process. Um, there's a question. I have a UCLA ID, but when I try to log in, it says it can't find it. If that's the case, what I recommend instead, um, there are two things that might be happening here, but I'll, I'll mention one thing first. One thing is to try and go just to jupiter.itery.ucla.edu first. Um, when you do that, it, it will take you to a login page. So there will be an orange button, um, which says to, to, to log in. And when you click on that, you'll be taken to a page that's called CI Logum. And in the menu that you're presented with, choose UCLA. Or you're also welcome to choose the Google option if you have the um, g.ucla.edu email address. So if, if clicking on the UCLA doesn't work, you can select the one for Google and use the g.ucla.edu account. <clears throat> if neither of those work, um, it could be that since this um, uses your email um, to identify your access, if you haven't publicly released your email, then you, um, the Jupyter Hub might not know how to identify you. Um, there's a message in the chat window. The Google link isn't live on this page. Uh, can you please be more specific? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, to follow through on what I was saying before, if you aren't able to access the Jupyter Hub, I would recommend accessing Binder instead. And Binder is you can access with this launch Binder button. Um, in the ideal case, what happens is that you land on a page that looks like this. <clears throat> and you'll see something that's similar to this regardless of whether you go to the Jupyter Hub or whether you access this through Binder. Um, the important thing at the moment isn't to uh, interact with Jupyter, it's to um, access an environment where we all have the same version of SQLite and where you can interact with the files. So if, if you have SQLite, and saw it on your computer and you just want to download these to your own computer, you're welcome to do that as well. To start, what we're going to do is interact with the terminal. So the first thing I'd like you to do when you see this page is to click on this button called terminal. And when, when you click on that, you'll be taken into a console with a blinking um, cursor. 
And then um, th this will just be your particular username. In this case, it's mine. The other thing that I want to do, so I've included some, some files here. You can, you can move this partition between the files that are in the directory and your terminal window by um, putting your mouse on top of the boundary and clicking and dragging it. The one I, I want us to open is this intro to SQL part one, which you can open by double clicking on it. When you double click on that, it's going to overlay the notebook. This is a Jupyter notebook on top of the terminal window. But I want to look at them simultaneously. You can drag these windows around in Jupyter Lab by putting your mouse on top of the tab that has the file name and, and dragging it around to different parts of the window. Um, for the moment, I'm going to put mine on the bottom. So now I can see both the terminal window and the notebook. So the, the notebook includes the commands that I'm going to be walking through. Um, you don't strictly have to look at it if you don't want to, but it's, it's what I'm going to be referring to. All right. The terminal button, um, if you don't see it, you can come up to file and then new, and then you want to open up the, the terminal. Yeah. All right. So I won't expect you to know many terminal commands. All of the ones that I mentioned um, are mentioned specifically in the notebook. So if you're not familiar with the terminal environment, don't, don't be worried. Um, we aren't going to require knowledge of the shell too much. But um, the first thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to use SQLite <coughs> um, to create a database with two tables, the tables that, we, that I mentioned before for students and classes. And then we're simply going to look at the records that we put into them. So we've already done this. We've opened up a terminal. And then SQLite 3 is the command to run SQLite. And first.db is what we're going to call our database. So we can create our database simply by executing this command. You're welcome to type it in, or you can also have copy and paste. Um, on my Apple, I use Apple C to copy and Apple V to paste. Or you can use mouse to copy and paste, however it is that you prefer to um, put these into the terminal. So when we execute that, just by hitting enter, what happens is that SQLite starts. We get a prompt um, that tells us we're using SQLite. Um, and it tells us that this command dot help will list usage hints. So I'm, I'm going to execute that dot help. So th this has quite a range. It's um, scrolled off my screen. Um, this can be a useful place to look if you want help. Um, I won't be referring to this too much, but it is here if you need to refer back to it later. Um, two of these that we will use. Um, one is, is going to be um, dot header on which means that the, <clears throat> the labels of the columns are going to be listed. And dot mode column just makes it a little easier to look at the column data in each of the tables. And then the third one that we're going to use is dot tables. So dot tables tells us all of the tables that are in our database. Currently, we haven't entered in any information. So if we enter dot tables, no information is returned. Um, all right, so, so now we're set up. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is create the table for students. This is the information that I had on the slide before. Now it's just in a comma separated value form. So it's easy to create tables with the create table comment or create table query. Just to orient you, SQL keywords uh, I have written here in all capital letters. Words that aren't in all capital letters are typically values uh, or parameters. So to create a table, we have to create table keywords. Then we have the name of our table that we want to create. And in between parentheses, we're going to list the, the columns that are in our table. So here we have student ID, name, and class ID. 
So we have student ID. After each parameter, we define what the data type is. So remember in contrast to spreadsheets, um, all of the values inside of this table have, uh, have a data type associated with them. There's the question, is SQL case sensitive? And the answer is no. So you're welcome to type all of these in lowercase if you don't want to type in uppercase. Um, I certainly, under, I'm, in fact, I'm going to do that shortly too because it's a little annoying to type in all uppercase. Um, so you're, you're welcome to type in whatever case you want. And that's true as well for the, for the variables and the parameters. Um, I'll just keep with all uppercase here for the moment. All right, so we type that in. At the end of the SQL query, we put a semicolon so that SQLite knows that we're done with our command. And we hit enter to execute it. And now if we look at tables, there's one table called students. Um, and I'll, I'll turn, turn the header on and I'll make the mode column. So we've checked that it exists with tables. And so now we come to another, probably one of the most common queries in SQL, select star from students, in this case, the, the table that we have. So select is, is the start of our query, where we try and retrieve data from the database. This asterisk tells it to retrieve everything. So we're gonna retrieve all of the columns and the rows from the table that we specified, which is students. And now I'll type this just in all lowercase for convenience. Um, so at the moment, there isn't anything in this. So it's not gonna show me anything. What we have to do is we have to add content to it. We add content with the insert into. So um, insert into, and then we specify the table. Um, and then it's not strictly required, but it is um, typically a best practice that you want to specifically specify the variables whose data you're entering. Um, so these are the columns that are currently in our table, student ID, name, and class ID. And then we have another SQL keyword, values. So into the students table, into these particular columns. We enter the values, and then I enter these values, which are the first row in the table that I want. One is an integer. Dora is a string, so we enter that between quotes, and then another integer. And close parentheses, semicolon. So now we've entered the first row into our table. You can scroll through um, previous commands that you've done with the up arrow. So if you press the up arrow, arrow that will scroll through your history of commands. Um, or you can press the down to get back. If I go up just to select star from students, now we'll see we have one row in our database. Uh, one row in our one table in our database. So we have we, we have values that we've entered. All right. We can check again that what our table name is, dot tables. We can also look at the databases that we have with dot databases. Um, so with SQLite, SQLite is um, relatively unique in that the database, um, it stores all of the information for a database database in a, in a file. So all of the information that we need for the databases is, is stored in this first.db file. If you interact with SQL um, more extensively, you'll likely come across different dialects of these relational database management systems. And with um, most of them, it requires spinning up a database server. So the database server itself um, handles off say user authentication, handling access permissions. You spin up the server and then the database is stored on the server and you have to connect to the server through a TCP IP protocol. SQLite is very, very lightweight. So it's very light. Um, 
and it stores information just in single files. So in this case, it's, it's a very convenient way for us to first interact with databases because it's so simple for us to interact with. Um, so that was just a little digression. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quit SQLite. That's kind of another key thing when interacting with the console. You quit just with dot quit. And then it returns me to my, my directory. So I, I realized I've done something a, a little funny here. Um, There's a question when I forget a semicolon, some weird intended error lines appear. How do I get out of that? Uh, you get out of that by entering the semicolon and hitting enter. So let me just digress a, a minute to, to show you what's happening here. So um, say I type um, select star from students with, without the semicolon, you'll get something that, look, that looks like this. Um, and the reason you see this is because um, the restrictions on white space in these SQL queries is a little loose. You can have white space and enters and tabs um, without having too much consequence for interpreting the query. You just have to end the query with the semicolon. So entering the semicolon will end the query. I can also type this just to make it easier to read as select star and then from students. So when SQL, um, SQL queries get very complex. You can end up with a lot of different rows to the queries. It can be useful to introduce formatting like this just to keep track of what the logic is for the query. So that's, that's why it has this funny kind of continuation in the console. So I'm going to quit. Um, so I realized what I did here, I'm not sure if this is true for you as well. But I, I created the database in my home directory. So if I do ls, that will list the contents. Um, I have an extra directory here. But if, if you see something like this, then you have also created the database in your home directory. Um, rather than in, inside of the IDRI intro to SQL folder, which is where we're storing our files. So if you come up here and you click on this folder, that will take you to your home directory. And here, here we can see the database that I created, first.db. So while I was sitting inside of that folder, that's where I created the database. Um, I can move the database simply by moving the file around. Um, so it isn't required to be in a specific location. The command to move at the shell is just mv, and then I'll move the database, which is first.db, into the folder idri intro to sql um, i could even rename it if i want i'm not going to i'll just leave it called first db yeah 0720 is as you're correct is for july 20th but it's just on mine it it isn't going to be present in your directories um, and then I can change the directory that I'm in by CD. So CD iterate intro to SQL will place me in, inside of the directory where I have all of my files. So I'll look at the files again with LS. These are the files that I have in my directory. And I have my first.db database file. So I can open it again with SQLite 3 and then the name of the database. That will open up the prompt again. And if I say tables, it, cho it shows me the table that I have that's stored inside of the database file. All right, so now, um, as I'm sure you might imagine, if, if you're entering lots and lots of rows, you, you don't really just want to enter them all at the command line certainly not by typing um, them individually. So fortunately, there are other ways to insert data into tables. So I'm going to navigate back into my folder by double clicking on this one. And I've included 
another file called insertstudents.sql. So if you double click on that, that's, that's this one. If I double click on that, it opens it up and you can view the contents of the file. So here are the commands to enter the other rows into the students table. Um, insert into students, that's the command to enter the data for a row. These are the columns and the values are specified here between parentheses. So this is the SQL script and it, it contains simply the SQL commands that I would otherwise enter at the command line. So if I go back to my terminal window, I'm going to quit with that quit. And this will allow me to execute the SQL, um, the SQL script and enter the data into the first dot, dot db. So I'm simply going to enter that at, at the prompt. Or you can copy and paste. And then I hit enter. So it doesn't return anything. But if I open up SQLite 3 again and um, look at the content with select star from students with the semicolon, now the data is entered into my database. And this, by the way, sh shows you what happens if you aren't using dot mode column. So the, the columns are separated by this vertical line. Um, there are some comments, no such file or directory. If that happens, for those of you who are seeing this at the command prompt, quit out of SQLite. And if, if you do list ls, you should see this specific file in, in whatever list of files it has. If that file is not in your directory, so I'll just move it one up. Um, let me see, how, how do you get that? Actually, um, for those of you who are, what I see is, yes, so if that's what you see, where, where is it that you're seeing no such file or directory? Do you see it at the command prompt or inside of SQLite 3? Okay, so, so there's um, no search file for insert students. So insert students, you have to be inside of, uh, you have to be inside of the IDRI intro to SQL directory. So in all likelihood, what you're inside of is your home directory. And you can change directories into the directory that I've shared with you by doing CD space. So right, right now I'm just talking about the questions that are in the chat window. So you can ignore what I'm talking about for the moment. To change directories from your home directory into the folder that I've shared with you, type cd space, and then the name of the folder, which is intro to SQL. So when you're inside of that directory, a list should show you all of the files that I've shared with you. And in particular, this is where I've shared with you the SQL script. So that SQL script isn't there, then um, this particular command won't know what to use for, for this file because it, it doesn't exist in, in the different directory. So as long as you're inside of this directory, this command should work. And now um, I'm gonna get back on, onto this one. So just to get back on track, I'm going to start up SQLite again and view the contents of this student's table. Um, and I, I view the contents with select star from students. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so in, in the process of, 
of moving the files around that I moved my database. So if the database isn't there, I'm not going to see the data that I entered. So you can ignore that as well. But now I have my database in the right place. And select star from student should show you the data that you, that you entered. Specifically, it shows you the four additional rows that you entered with the SQL script. And if you do dot tables, you'll, you'll see the student's table. So, so we've completed this first section here. We've created the student's table. The next thing we want to do is create the classes table. So I'm going to show you yet a third method for inserting data, which is something that you might want to do with data of your own, say, to import it. Say you have data in a spreadsheet you can export the spreadsheet as a comma separated value set of data, which would end up looking like this. These are com comma separated values. Um, so if you have a CSV file, you can import that directly into a table in the database. So this is our command to create the table. For the classes, we only have the class ID on the title. There are only two columns, so I'm going to copy and paste that one. Um, this is particular to SQLite, but we set the mode to handle CSV, which is comma separated values. Uh, there's a question, can we not insert the rows when we are already in SQLite? You, you, can enter, you can enter any rows that you want at the terminal prompt. I'm, I'm simply showing you another method to import all of the data from a CX, CSV file in, into the table. There's a question, how did I include the other three rows? So for, for the students table, all of the rows, the information for the rows is included inside of the SQL script. These are, so if I executed each of these lines at the command prompt, this would be row two, row three, four, and five. That's how I included. All of the rows get executed at once when you execute the script, not just a single one. So getting back to this, I've set the CSV mode, and then I'm gonna execute this. This is a command to import inside of SQLite. This is the CSV file. So I'll show you what this is. This is insert classes.csv. If I double click on that, I'm going to bring this up here. Th these are the values that I want. These are the headers, the class ID and the title. And then these are the values inside of the cells. So this is the con so Jupyter is, is actually showing me this as a table rather than as the CSV text, but inside of the file, they're just comma separated values with these partic particular values. And then I want to insert it into classes, which is the table that I just created. All right. So now I've done something intentionally uh, tricky Perhaps I shouldn't have in this case, but there are a few things that I wanted to illustrate. Um, one is this is just a file of comma separated rows. Um, so I'm gonna set header back to on and I'm gonna set mode to column. So if I look at the data with select star from classes, it actually got imported when I ran this import, it imported the header row in addition to all of the, the other rows. And that's, that's the first thing that I really didn't um, want to happen, although there are ways to handle um, rows that you say want to delete. The second thing that happened is um, we can see SQLite doesn't strictly enforce the type. So um, despite specifying a type, it still allowed me to add um, something that's more like a text string inside of an integer column. Um, it, this is kind of one of the intricacies of SQLite. 
So you do have to be careful, actually, when you import a CSV file, it will treat all of the values as text, um, in, initially as text. Um, and the second thing, which, well, the third thing is something I'm gonna show you here. You don't have to execute this yourself. But if I execute the import command again, and I look at the data, there's nothing that stops me from importing duplicate data. And that's something that we don't really want to happen, particularly because we want these to be unique identifiers. And that's something that I mentioned um, uh, for databases. For these tables, we want a unique identifier. Um, and if we try and add something, say, that has three, we don't want it to have a different title because then this particular identifier would refer to do different things and it wouldn't serve to establish relationships with other tables. So um, all of these are somewhat non-ideal in this case. So I'm gonna show you the way to get rid of a table. Say, say you get yourself into hard spot and you just wanna delete the data. Drop, drop table and then the name of the table will allow you to, to delete the table. So whereas now my tables are classes and students, when I say drop table classes and I look at tables again, the students table has been deleted. So drop table and the table name is the, the syntax for, for deleting a table. And now I'm gonna recreate the tab table with um, additional keywords to to kind of handle the cases which I ran into. So this is our familiar create table. In addition to specifying the class ID as an integer, I wanna specify that it's not null. So we'll come to what null values are a little later. Um, not null just means that it, it has to have some specific value to it. It can't just say be empty. And then we also specify that it's a primary key. So for columns that are primary keys, it will enforce that they have to be unique. And furthermore, it specifies that this is a unique identifier for the values. And then we keep, we keep the value, or we keep the data type for title, title the same as text. Now, um, now when I import the CSV file, It's gonna, it's gonna give me an error, which is good. That's what I wanted. It tells me that there was a data type mismatch, and the data type mismatch was class ID. Class class ID, which was included before, <coughs> here, was a string that I I didn't want to include as an identifier. This is just the header row for the CSV file, and it tells me it tells me that there was a data type mismatch, so the insert failed. And that, that just means that the data wasn't added to the table. So specifically, we already have the column name, so we don't need the header line. So um, for those of you who are following along with this, you can skip this. I'm, I'm not going to, to talk about that. You can read, read it later if you want. But for the moment, I'm just gonna look at what the content is inside of classes. Despite the fact that um, it did not succeed on class ID, it still successfully imported the data for the rest of the rows. <clears throat> so now, now we've, set up, we've set up our table for classes and we've set up our table for students. So now, now we have the database that we want. We have the database with two tables, which you can list with tables. And these tables have the data that we wanted to import. So we imported in one case by imp importing the CSV file, or we use the SQL script, or you can insert data simply by typing at the command line. Those are, are three different ways that I've showed you to add, add the data.
So I'm going to take a break and allow people to catch up. Um, and um, let me know if, if there are any questions in the chat window that you have. What I've been talking about, this, this is, might feel like a lot at the moment. We're gonna get into something which is just executing SQL queries, which might seem easier than this. But at the beginning, it is necessarily necessary just to establish the database environment. So there's a comment, I haven't been able to get any data loaded in. That's okay. So um, for the moment, we're going to start using a different database. So if you don't have these specific tables, don't worry about it, that's okay. There's a question when using select. Um, can you please? Oh, when using a star from classes, I get a different format that is hard to read. Um, so there shouldn't be an issue with permissions. To, to get it to mine, so I'll, I'll show you again, this is included in the notebook, but what I did for a prettier format was say dot header on, and I did dot mode column. When I execute these two, header dot on will give me this header, and then dot mode column will give these a nicer spacing. So without the dot mode column, it will just show you these particular values with vertical bars between them. If you select dot mode CSV, dot mode CSV will show you these as comma separated values. And so to clarify, we can look at what's inside of the classes table. This is the information that should be inside of the classes table now. So yes, only for students did you create it from scratch. Um, so as far as quitting and restarting again, to quit, I do dot quit. Let me close this down. I can list the contents in my directory with ls. And inside of this, you should see the databases. So this in particular is the database that I created, first.db. To get started again, I um, type SQLite3, S-Q-L-I-T-E-3, and then the name of the database that I've created. And then that takes me back to the SQLite prompt. So inside of this, all of the data for the database is stored inside of this file. So when I load it, it's, it's present when I start up SQLite 3. Uh, so actually, as far as filling the rest with null, I think we'll have to come back to that at, at the end, if, if you still want to go through this again. Yeah, never mind. I realized I forgot CSV mode. Oh, okay. So as, as far as the, there's a comment about the commands that start with dot, like dot tables, and then ones without the dot. So the ones with the dot are specific to the SQLite um, 3 application that we're running. When I say dot help, dot help, for example, shows me all of these dot commands. So for example, dots, dot tables with the name of the table will list the name of tables matching like uh, mat matching, um, matching whatever is specified here for table. It also has um, dot mode will set the output mode. Dot headers on or off will turn the dis the display of the headers on or off. So um, so yes, turning turning the header and on and the mode set to column will turn 
will set those for all of the tables that you view, not just for the specific tables that you've created. So and any of the dot commands, um, don't, they also don't need um, a semicolon at the end of them. So the dot commands are not SQL commands. These are just commands in the particular application that we're running. The SQL commands, of which I've only showed you something like select. At, at the moment, I've, I've showed you um, commands that start with select. This is, this is the SQL query. And the SQL query, you have to, um, you have to end, end with a, the semicolon. So SQL queries, you end with a semicolon, the dot, the dot commands, you don't. And the dot commands are not, not SQL queries. The dot commands kind of um, return information about the environment or about the database, but they don't return data information from the database. All right. So I think that the questions have died down a little. I'm going to continue on. Um, so I'm going to do dot quit and um, just to start again from the terminal. So in in these files that I've shared with you is is this this survey database. Um, we'll we'll leave students and classes um, until later. But we'll so we'll, we'll start working with the new database which I've pre-given to you that's populated with all of the data that you need, just so that we have a database for everybody. Um, so ignore this thing about attaching the database. For the moment, um, what's important to know is the files um, for the data that you're gonna be looking at are included in these um, comma separated value files. There's one for, for each of the tables. There are gonna be four tables in the database called survey visited person and site. Um, so for example, if I open up survey.csv by clicking on it, this, this shows me the data that's in the survey table. And I'm going to actually widen my screen a little. And I'm going to move these up here to the upper right, just so that we can keep a tab on what they are. You don't necessarily have to do this if you just want to look at my screen while I'm interacting with these. So the, um, inside of this, this database, there are four tables that we're going to be working with. Person um, is just the name, first and last name, along with an identifier. Site, so this is the theoretical expedition to Antarctica. So these are scientists, the names of scientists. The site, there's an identifier for the particular site at which they gathered scientific data. And associated with that site, there's a latitude and longitude. Inside of the visited table, um, there's an identifier for the particular visit date. There's a date and the site that they visited. And then inside of survey, there are four columns. One is taken. This is an ID which matches with the ID that's shown and visited. There's the person who took the measurements and then potentially various things. There's um, RAD stands for radiation, SAL stands for salinity, say for water, and temp stands for temperature. And then there's the particular quantity that they measured. So this has four columns, the identifier, the identifier that relates to the person table, the quantity and the, and the particular measurement. So these are just to refer to for the data. The data has already been entered into the database. And um, the database is this one, survey.db. I'm going to pull this down a little. So to, to open it up inside of SQLite, I do SQL ITE3, and then the name of the database, survey.db. And I hit enter. 
So the, the first thing I'm going to do is just look at the tables that I have with dot tables. This is not a SQL query. This is just one of those dot commands. And I can see the four tables that I have, person, site, survey, and visited. So as far as querying the data, this is a SQL query. This is our command to return all of the rows and all of the columns from the person table. So I'm going to, I'm going to copy this and paste it in. So this, this shows me this doesn't have the headers on it and it doesn't have a prettier formatting for the columns. It just separates columns by the vertical line. And we can see that this matches up with what's inside of the comma separated value file. So to make things prettier, I'll do dot header on and I'll do dot mode column. And this changes the display for any any of the returned results from the SQL commands. So now when I do select star from person, we can see that the column um, titles and we see more spacing in between the columns. That's this header on and mode column. So now, now we're gonna get rolling with some more SQL commands. Um, I won't give any more of these dot commands for the moment. What I'll be talking about is just all um, SQL commands. So we've seen to select star. This is to select all of the rows and all of the columns. But typically we don't want all of the data. So you can specify specific columns by rather than having the asterisk for everything, you specify the specific names for the columns that you want to retrieve. In this case, I'll be returning family and personal columns. When I execute that, um, it also remembers the order that I specified. So rather than the original table personal was in the middle and family was on the right, um, it, it obeys the order that I've specified inside of the SQL command. So I've selected these two columns from the person table and it's returned all of the rows. So as we've mentioned before, case doesn't matter. You can have any case that you want um, and you can also include the returns here if you want to put it on different lines. It doesn't have to be in different lines. Um, the only thing that has to be obeyed is that you have to um, say keep strings with all of the characters together in the right order. That, that returns the same thing. So case doesn't matter. You can also have duplication. There isn't really any reason to do this at the moment, but you can return the same column multiple times simply by um, specifying it multiple times in your SQL query. So there's a question, what's the advantage of having multiple tables connected instead of just one huge table with all of the information? Um, the disadvantage with having one huge table is that you duplicate information. So say, say that I wanted all of these and um, this has the idea of person. So I could link this against the survey table and I could put all of the person data inside of additional columns in here. But every time I have this person ID, I just have the same first and last name. So rather than having the first and last name just once here in this table to refer to, I would have it duplicated by however many times this ID appears here. So um, that's a waste of space. And in the design of databases, you try and optimize um, the design of your tables um, to, to kind of accommodate space and use requirements. So another thing that you want to do is you want to optimize the speed of the queries. So you want to be very good about how, how it is that you organize your data. So I'll, I'll come back here. I can specify um, the same column names within a, a single query. So it's yeah. 
so it's it's given me as many columns as I've asked for, um, and return them even though this is duplicate information. But I rec I can return duplicate information in my queries if I want to. So what I'd like you to try and do now is just write a query that selects only the name column from the site table. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of seconds here. If you get an error, no such table person, that likely means that you haven't um, started with the database. So if, if that's the case, um, quit out of SQLite. This is just, I'm entering commands with respect to the chat question. Um, list the contents in your folder. And inside of this folder, you should see the survey.db. That's, that's the database that you want to use. And the command to start with it is SQLite3 um, survey.db. So here, I have to set my, my view preferences again. But when now when you look at tables, you can see that the, the tables that you're connected to with dot tables in person should be listed here. Um, it's also possible that you entered the wrong, something wrong in a SQL query. Um, in response to the query that selects only the name from the site table, how we do that is we say select and then the title name, the name of the column, which here is just name. I come up to site, so name. And when we want to select that from the table called site. So this is the name column from the site, which matches up here. So say, say that we're looking at all of the quantities from the survey table, which if I look at them here, there's a question, what's the difference between survey.csv and survey.db? Um, survey.csv is this particular file that contains the da data for the, there, there's some ambiguity here, but in this case, survey is the name of data inside of this file. The CSV is the comma separated value file. Survey.db is the name of the survey database. And inside of the survey database, there's actually a table called survey. So survey is the name of the database and also the name of the table. But inside of survey.db, you have these four tables. Yeah. Um, there's another one, everything appears to enter correctly, but it won't return the tables. Um, perhaps you can um, enter a private chat with, with Yo to try and straighten that out. All right, so, so getting back to this, so, say we're looking at the survey table and we wanna look at the, the quantities that have been measured. So, I mentioned radiation, salinity, and temperature, but there are a lot of um, rows. Well, there's not a huge number of rows, but there are a fair number of rows. So when we select quant from survey, we're, we're gonna see all of the values. It's gonna return all of the rows. We can return only the distinct values with the distinct keyword. So this helps us if we only wanna look at what the particular values are of quant that are in the survey table, we can, instead of saying select quant from survey, we can select distinct quant from survey. And that will return only the, the unique values that are inside of the column. We can also do this in pairs. So say, say that we don't want to just return the unique values of quantity, but we want to return the unique quantities and also the identity, the, the particular um, identification number that they're associated with. So in this case, um, it returns 
we can see a little more specific information about um, what data was taken on what particular day, which is what's associated with the ID. These are a little bit jumbled. So another important keyword is the order by. And the order by allows you to return results <clears throat> in either ascending or descending order. So by default, it's in ascending order. And what it's going to do is it's going to return that this, it's going to return the table like this, but with the, with um, the values ordered by um, how they're represented in the quantity column. So when I do this, it does it alphabetically. It returns all of the radiation values first, then the salinity, and then the temperature. But you can you can switch the order as well. Instead of by default. With the ascending order, you can do it descending by giving the DESC keyword. Um, so this, this particular query is the same as what returned this one, but it's going to, it's, now it's going to, um, currently these are in ascending order numerically. It will keep the order of the quant the same, but it will return the taken values in descending order. So we, we still have al alphabetically ascending for quantities and descending numerically for the taken. And we've gotten that with the descending DESC keyword. So the order, as is obvious from the, the quantity column, um, can, it can be ordered by text, say alpha, alphanumerically. This particular query will get everyone from the person table, which are these particular values. It will return all of the columns and all of the rows, and it will order it um, alphabetically by what the ID is. And it's going to do that in ascending order. So now, now we have an alphabetical list of by ID of all of the, all of the scientists who are on the expedition. And just to reiterate the point here, we can also sort them in descending order. Um, so I, I mentioned not null when we were creating the table before. Um, you might also see that there are some, some null values that are present in the tables that we've been looking at. So for example, these, there, there are missing values. So SQL, doesn't just follow with Boolean logic where you have like a true and a false. There's um, a triple value. So it's say true, false, and null. And null is something that SQL is going to punt on and not um, return any value to you. Um, so I, I bring that up because if um, depending on the columns that we're looking at, in this particular one, we look at the survey table. We look at the quantities, the quantities and the persons in the survey table, and we order them by the quantities. But you see here, here we get um, these, this is a null value, but nothing is returned for the null value because it, it doesn't have the value. Um, so so there, are, there are these things which look like empty cells. And it, it's not actually empty. It does. It is considered to be something called null. So null, null is another keyword, um, and it, it's actually ordered as well. Um, here we've ordered the things by the quantity. Um, if we also order by the person, um, the null is the first thing that gets returned, but then um, the order for the rest of the values. And in some sense, we don't know how to order on null because we don't know what the value is. So um, I'll come back to this a little bit later too. This is kind of our first introduction to null. So now we've come up to two more exercises that I'd like you to try. One is to write a, a query that selects the distinct dates, the distinct dates shown here in the visited table. 
and then try writing a query that shows the full name of the scientists and the person table um, ordered by their family name. And by full name, I mean first last name. And then um, we've come to the halfway point. So once, once you're done with these exercises, um, let's take a, um, let, let's take a, a 10 minute break. Um, I'm going to take just, just a short break here too, but um, I'll come back. So if, if you have questions, um, I'll come, I'll be back in just a minute here and um, feel free to enter chat questions and I'll answer some chats. Oh, there's a question, a database can have multiple CSVs. Um, typically a database doesn't have a CSV. A CSV is just a file format. Let me open up one of these to, to show you. Um, a, a CSV file is a plain text file that has something like this, where you have values which are separated by commas. The CSV is just a file format. Inside of the database, the database, if I look at, um, I'm gonna quit out of this. You don't have to worry about what VI is, but VI is just a, a text editing program. So if I look at what's inside of the database, the, um, it's the database management system that you know, can determine how data is stored inside of the database. And it doesn't have to be stored in text format. What's stored inside of the database isn't rendered here because the text editor doesn't recognize the characters. But the, um, what's stored inside of the database is values that get inserted into the tables. So the survey database technically has tables. It doesn't have CSV, but it does have data that have been stored in the CSV and entered into the tables. Um, yes, to open a terminal, you come up to the file menu, go down to new, and then say terminal. And when you, when you click on that, it should open a terminal window. To navigate into the folder that we're inside of, you do cd, which is the command to change the directory, and then um, cd idri intro to sql. And then once you hit return, you can do ls to list the file contents. And this, this is what you should see, which has the survey.db. There's a question, if you're logged into GitHub, will this save it? Um, so just to differentiate between some of these services that you're interacting with, GitHub is a, um, is a website where you can store, um, they're called repositories. So you can store repositories of information. 
this particular GitHub repository that I pointed you to, this is stored on the web. If you're accessing something through the, the launch binder link, that will not save. But if you're accessing things through launch into Jupyter Hub, that will be saved. So on your URL bar, if you see jupyter.itri.ucla.edu, all the files that you access there will be persistent. Um, so you can log out and you can log back in again. If you want to access it after the course, you don't have to click on the link that's on the GitHub repository. That, the GitHub page was just to make a place that saved the files so that you could access them. But to access the Jupyter Hub with this, just type jupyter.idri.ucla.edu. And it will, it will actually launch you into something like this. So it's not, um, within Jupyter, there's, there, there are um, two different main environments that you can interact with. One looks like this, where it's more like, a, this is called the classic notebook environment. You can change back to the one that has more windows. If you come up to tree and replace tree with lab, this will take you to Jupyter Lab. Um, and Jupyter Lab is one that has a snazzier graphical user interface. And I'm using this just so that I can show multiple windows at once. Um, there's another question. You have all the four CSV, the four CSVs. We didn't actually import this as tables ourselves. I just gave you the, the CSVs so that you could look at the data separately from what's inside of the database. Um, I'll close this tab. So the, the, the CSVs um, are um, text files that I shared with you so that you could have text files which showed you the data. And I, I just have them here so that we can refer to what the, what the content of the data is. But what I'm showing you here, these aren't tables that are stored in the database. These are just um, Jupyter is rendering them as tables, but these are simply the content that's stored in the text files. Um, and then the, 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 uh, the survey.db I also shared with you in the repository. So I gave you the, the survey database already populated with all the information in the tables. And then for, for first.db, yes, that's the one that we created the students and classes table we created that ourselves. So first.db is not stored in the GitHub repository um, by itself. All right, so let's let's get back started. Um, the query to select distinct dates shown in the visited table. So we want to select distinct. Um, and inside of the visited table, the dates are labeled as dated. That's the name of the column from the visited table. That gives you the, the distinct dates. And actually all of, the, all of the values here are distinct. So it just returns the values in this case, the same values as what are in the column. As far as the query that shows the full names of scientists that are in the person table, the personal column is the first name, the family column is the last name. So we wanna select personal comma family to select those two columns. We select it from the um, table called person. And then we order, order by family. So that gives us first name, last name, and ordered by, ordered alphabetically by the, the family name. So as you can see, to some extent, these SQL queries end up, you end up thinking of the logic like you're writing a sentence. You do have to be careful about the order and about the keywords, but otherwise you can think of the logic like how you would express, express a question directly to the database to retrieve the data that you want. There's something else which is useful is to um, try and filter the data. So we've been returning Aside from the distinct, we've been returning all of the values for the rows. But say we want to enter in some, some conditional statements. So for example, in the site table, this isn't very hard to look at, but say we only wanted 
the geographical information for DR1. We can still say select star from visited to get all of the, uh, I'm sorry, yes, this, this particular query is from the visited here. So what, what we're querying is, is all of the visits that were made to the DR1 site. So we can select all of the rows and all of the columns, but we give it an additional conditional with the where keyword. And after the where keyword, we specify what our condition is. And we want the site, the value in the site column to be equal to this particular string. So it's only gonna return, it's only gonna return a row where this condition is true. So it returns the ID, the site, and the data for only those sites for which this condition is true. Um, the column name, here we selected all of the columns. But you can select specific columns and the column that you return values for it doesn't even have to match the column on which you did the condition. So in this case, say we only wanted the site, or the, the visit IDs for those particular sites in this subset of data. We can still do that just by specifying the column name. So there are a variety of things that you can use with uh, as conditionals. One is the equal, just to say where a value is equal to either a string or a number, say. You can also use and and or as conditionals. So this one is going to return the sites where, or the visits where the site was DR1 and where the date, which is stored in the dated column, is less than 1930. So sometime before 1930. So it returns the two, the two site visits in 1927. In this case, this is ordered by, um, no increasing date. Or we can also do it by, this shows an example with the or. So in this case we have, we're using the survey table. We're selecting all of the rows and all of the columns where person, the person identifier is either equal to lake or the person identifier is equal to row. So this shows us all of the visits, all, all, the, all of the measurements that Lake and Rowe did. There are some additional conditionals that you can use besides the equal and using the and and the or. So additional SQL keywords you can use in to test the membership of a group. You can use between for, for a range and you can use like when you're trying to match on strings. So we'll come to an example, but you can use wildcard characters. So if, if you only know, say, say in this particular one, you know that the person's name contained a K, you could use percent K percent to say, at some point in the string, there has to be a K. So the percent could be a wildcard meaning anything or the underscore could be a single character. For the first one, I'll show the N is for member, group membership. So this query is the same as, as this one, where we select all the rows and columns from survey where um, person is in this group. So either person is equal to lake or person is equal to row, which is the same as here. You do have to watch out for the order that you're evaluating something. So if you have multiple conditionals, they're evaluated in sequence. So the and is going to be evaluated first before the or. Whereas if you look at the logic of this, likely what this person wanted to say is you want um, those rows where the quantity is equal to salinity and the person is either lake or row. You don't want quantity equals salinity and person is equal to lake to be evaluated before the or. So this, this gives us something where um, Right, a quantity of radiation is returned. 
where in all likelihood we just wanted salinity. So you can use parentheses inside of these SQL statements um, to more specifically satisfy or to more specifically specify which conditionals you want to evaluate first. So here we say person is equal to lake or person is equal to row and quantity is equal to salinity, which will get rid of this radiation, radiation measurement. And then here's, here's an example from, for a wild card. So in this case, we're looking at the visited table and we're looking at those sites that are like, i.e. that the site name has characters which start with DR and then is um, zero or any number of characters after that. So we'll give DR1 and DR3, but not the MSK4. And then we can combine all of our key, well, many of our keywords together, we can specify distinct, to specify distinct pairs. These are um, returned as distinct af after the condition has been satisfied. <coughs> so I have another exercise for you to try. I've given you something that's actually incorrect. So say we all, here we have um, sites. We have the latitude and longitude. So say we want all of the sites that lie within 48 degrees of the equator. So the latitude is from negative 48 to positive 48. But when I, when I check this query, oops, what it returns is um, something that's outside of the bounds. It also returns negative 49. So the exercise is how do you fix this? Um, the, the easiest way to halt a query midline. I'm not sure what you mean by halt, but if you mean just entering the query on multiple lines, you can hit the return or the enter key. So for like for this one, I would hit the enter here. Oh, to, to get out of a query, to stop it. I don't think any of the queries that you've entered should be long running queries. So if it's, um, if it looks like it's running forever, you might just have to hit, hit the semicolon to, to stop it. And, and that, that would just complete the query. In extreme cases, you can, um, if you do control D, that will, uh, that will quit the SQLite program. Um, control, control D might be necessary just to quit the program and then you can start it back up again. So here I'll do, I'll execute this query. Um, what we want actually is where the latitude is greater than negative 48 and um, latitude is less than 48. There's another exercise, Norm normalized salinity reading should be between zero and one. So in the survey table, return the salinity readings and then return the records from the survey table that are outside of this range. There's a question for the previous one, wouldn't we want to use less than or equal to and greater than or equal to? Um, strictly speaking, yes, if you want to include, if you want to um, include the endpoints, you would want to do that.
So I'll show um, different ways to, to address this salinity reading. I'm going to select everything from the survey table um, where quant is equal to salinity. And we want the survey reading to be in between the bounds of zero and negative one. Uh, um, we, want to, we want to find those values that are outside of this range. To find values that are inside of the range, um, let's say I'm reading say less than or equal to one. Reading is greater than or equal to zero. I didn't do the select. Those are all the okay ones. But um, so if I want something that doesn't satisfy this, I can use not. That returns me values that are outside of the range. I can do another one where I can say, um, I could also say instead of, well, so I want everything that's less than zero or greater than one. So I didn't have to use the not keyword. And I've, there's an error in this one as well. So it's, we don't want the and, we want the or. That gives me the values that are outside of the range. And then to show you one final thing, we can use the between. So between is another keyword. So the quantity is a salinity and reading um, not between zero and one. Right. So, so in addition to doing numerical comparisons, um, I'm going to. You can calculate. You can do simple math on the values that are in the columns. One thing we found here is that the person identified as row was making salinity readings that were outside of the bounds. So we're going to try and um, we're going to try and return values that correct that. Just to show you the, the readings um, of everybody for the salinity, this selects all the rows where the quantity was equal to salinity um, ordered by person. So you can see the values that were within the range between zero and one and the ones that were outside, outside the range. In all likelihood, it looks like these are just off by a factor of 100. Um, there's a question, could I do something like not in and zero, you would have to use the comma one. Um, I don't think that that will work because in is for group membership. It doesn't really specify a range of numerical values. Um, but the way to see what it does is to try and execute that as a query and see what it returns. So back back to this, say I return this um, survey values where we're measuring salinity. I want to return person quant and re reading divided by 100. I can do this simple math on the values in the column to try and correct the values of row that are off. So these salinity readings get more in line, but the rest of them are not correct because now these are off by a factor of 102. I didn't, I applied the div division by 100 on all of the values in the column, not just specific ones. 
So just to, to show you additional math you can do, you can do multiplication with the asterisk. This will multiply all of the readings for radiation by 1.05. So something else you might notice is here, this title for the column included how you specified the name in the SQL query. So this is reading divided by 100. This is reading times 1.05. Um, that's not ideal when we're just, if, if we want to convey some kind of meaning to the name of the title, it isn't useful just to have the numerical expression here. Really what we might want to say is the column labeled as radiation corrected by 5%. So you can use, you can relabel columns using the as keyword. So in this case, we return the reading column multiplied by 1.05 and we use as to relabel the name of the column in the result that's returned. So now, now it's, it's labeled with what we specified with as. All right, now I'm gonna show you an, addition, an additional example. The temperature readings are in Fahrenheit. So when we look at all of the temperature readings in the survey table, it returns these. So a useful calculation say that you might want to do is you might want to return the temperature in Celsius instead of Fahrenheit. So this is the formula for converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius. We subtract, subtract the temperature by 32, divide by nine, multiply by five. And then this other one, this rounds, it rounds um, a float to give you only two decimal points of precision. And then we use the as keyword to relabel the column. This now is temperature in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. So th these are mighty frigid temperatures, just for reference, <clears throat> or it's kind of a bit of trivia, the temperature of negative 40 is the common temperature for Fahrenheit and Celsius. So th these aren't very different. You can also do operations on strings. So before we selected the first and last name from the person table, these vertical bars will allow you to do operations on a uh, string concatenation. So this will return the first and the last name um, in kind of a more user-friendly format. All right, but back to our case with salinity. Um, here is how we wanted to correct the values for rho. So rho was off by a factor of 100 in salinity. So we divided by, we divided our reading by 100. And we're only returning those specific rows for the person called row. Sorry. Um, what we want to do is we want to only apply the division by 100 to the values for row, but we want to return the same readings for everybody else without the correction of division by 100. So I'm gonna correct that by introducing the notion of unions. With a union, you can, den you can combine the results of two different tables. So a union, say, if, if you have a set of numbers, taking the union will return all of the numbers in both sets. Here is say we have two different tables with different rows. Returning the union of them will return the rows that are present in in both of the tables. So if we select, if we just look at this query, um, this selects all of the rows from the person table where ID is equal to Dyer. So that, that returns the name for Dyer. We can also do it for row. That returns the row for row, or in this case, Valentina. If we do a union, 
we're going to return the results from both of these queries. So this was our first query and we perform a union on it with the second query. That returns the um, rows from both of the queries. This can, can be compared against the union all. So say, say we have the first query, which just returns one row for Dyer. And we want to combine it with this one, which selects all of the rows from person. This now also has a row called Dyer. So if we do a union all, union all will strictly return um, the combination of every row from one table with every row from the other query. So in this case, it will return Dyer twice. If we just use um, union, say, so we do select star from person where ID is equal to Dyer union rather than union all, select star from person. Now, now we don't have the duplicate um, The, um, so with the and, there's a question, how is union different from and or or? The, the and is used in conditional statements. So it's intended to return like a combination of um, checks on truth value conditions. The union is, is um, combining two different tables rather than trying to combine the results of two different conditionals. There's another question, what is the the use for a union all. Um, <laughs> actually, at, so at the moment, I can't think of what the, the use is, but um, yeah, that might be something to, to Google. All right, so, so we've come to another exercise. Um, try and use union to show salinity divided by 100 for rho and the original salinity readings for everyone else. That, that was our goal. So unfortunately, it's, it's hard for me to keep tabs on where everyone is without being in person. But uh, I'll assume you've made at least some progress here and I'll, I'll show you how I would tackle this. So uh, I want to select, let's say I just want to select the, the person and reading divided by 100 um, from the survey table where um, person is equal to row. So that that will do it for row. I'm sorry, and, and where the salinity, um, where quant is equal to salinity and person is equal to row. 
that that returns the person and and the corrected values for the salinity reading for rho. So to this now, I, I want to take a union. I want to combine that with a table where um, I have have the same columns, but I don't divide the reading by one hundred. I still want them to be selected where the quantity is equal to the salinity reading for everybody else. Um, and I'm going to say, and the person is not equal to row. So this will return to me a table with the corrected values, and this will return a table with the original values. And then I take the union of them together. And that, that returns a table with all of the salinity readings that were taken where we've only corrected the readings for row. There's a question, is there a distinction between single and double quotes? I'm not sure in, in uh, SQLite, I don't think that there is. I, um, it may depend on which dialect of, um, uh, which particular database management system you're working with. But um, um, that just involves a little more investigation into the, into the other dialects. For the moment, I'm going to bypass null. I have talked a lot, a little bit about it, um, um, but in the interest of introducing you to um, something additional besides null. There's a question right now, we are only displaying the results instead of actually changing the data in the database. That's correct. You're only returning the results. So I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit through the notebook to where I um, say aggregate calculations group by and having. So in addition to doing mathematical operations like these, um, there are additional SQL keywords that you can use to calculate summary, kind of summary information about the data that's in your tables. So these include things like count, average, sum, mean, min, and max. So count, look at count. Um, count will return the number of rows in this case, we're returning all of the rows from the, uh, the count, the count of all of the rows that are in the survey table. So in the survey table, there are 21 rows, count parentheses, asterisk, will return all of the, uh, the number of rows in the table. Returning, um, say in this case, the min, this will return the minimum of all of the rows that satisfy the condition um, of the quant being equal to temp, which is the temperature. So this returns the minimum temperature found in the survey data. Uh, let's see. This is actually should be um, in. So we want we want min min of the of the value that's in the reading column, where the quantity is the temperature. So this this returns the minimum temperature that was measured. From um, there's a question: How, how do you return? How, how do you um, how do you exclude the column name when you do count? So say, say you do select count from survey. What you would have to do is you would have to use the as keyword to, to relabel the column. Um, it's up to you what you want to relabel it as. Let's say we do um, simply number of columns. 
a number of rows. So in that, that case, it will relabel the column. You could relabel it as uh, something empty if you don't want to label. So it's, it can also be important to, um, to calculate these summaries for particular, say, groups within your table. So in this particular case, what we're looking at, we're looking at the survey table and we're grouping it by person. What this does is it will, it will return all of the rows um, for, for each person. So in this case, what it's returning, it's saying uh, there are two rows that have a null value for, um, for Dyer and et cetera. So um, in this case, it's not returning uh, the count of all of the rows. It's, it's first grouping the rows by um, this particular quantity person, which here is, is the person identification ID. And then it's, it's counting the rows within each of those groups. Um, here now I will mention null. Perhaps we don't want to include null because we don't know how to classify it. So you can get rid of the null by saying where person is not null. Um, typically to specify equality with null, you would either say is null or is not null. And that's like saying, um, that's giving you a conditional on null values. So that gets rid of the null. One thing that's important to note is that you don't want the where after the group by. Um, so doing something like this, well, here, here's the correct order. Select these columns from a table where this condition and you group it by this, um, this quantity. If instead of you do it backwards where you say group by this, where this condition, you'll get an error. And so the reason is the where clause will filter on individual records. So where, where can't be applied as a condition to a group. So the where has to precede the group by. If you want to include a condition on the group, there's something different called the having clause. Uh, there's a question. Yes, I, I will post solutions and um, we'll also be posting a recording of the video um, on YouTube. So that'll be available as well. So if, if we want to do a condition on the groups that we're selecting, here we're looking at the survey table. We're selecting the taken column, which is the ID column. And we're looking at all a uh, count of the columns. We're grouping, grouping them by the taken ID. So we're looking at the count for each of the individual taken IDs. And we only want to return those which had um, more than two rows. So if we do this, this now applies the condition, not on the individual rows, but a condition on the group. So say having count greater than two is saying once you've counted the rows in each of the groups, say for 734, if we look here for 734, there are two, there are three rows. It returns three as the count and it's returned because three is greater than two. So having applies the condition after the group where we'll apply the condition on individual rows before the group is, is performed. Sometimes this can be a little mind bending to try and get your head around the logic. So let, let's, let's look at a different query. Um, if we look at this, this now we group by taken we're looking at the survey table and we're returning the taken column and the count of all of the rows for each of the IDs. 
Now let's say we do something like this, where we still do the group by taken. We look at those that have a count that's greater than two, but we say we want to return all of the rows, um, all of the rows that have, say, 734. We want to return all three of them, as well as saying that the count for 734 is three. Um, what's returned by SQL when you do a group by in having, um, it doesn't have multiple rows associated with it. So SQL isn't going to try and return values, isn't going to try and return all of the rows after it's done the group by. What it does return, it returns all of the taken IDs, which have a, more than two rows associated with them. But for the other columns, um, it just inserts the first value that's, say, for 734, this is the first value that it encounters when it's going through the table. So it returns PVRAD in 8.41 as a value for 734, rather than returning all three rows. So when you're looking at SQL queries, you can you can have subqueries which return tables. And um, complex SQL queries can have multiple subqueries and returning results from tables that then get combined with other tables. So if we want to actually get all of the entries for a given value of taken with the count greater than two, we can use one of these subqueries. And a subquery you put a select statement in parentheses and use it as if it was another table. So let me break, oops. Let me break down what, what this one is doing. So here we're selecting all of the rows from the survey table with a value of taken that's inside of the group that's defined by um, this particular table. So this table, this is our subquery. This, this one is, is the values of taken, which have um, more than two rows associated with them. So if taken is part of that group, then we're gonna return all of the rows. So this one now does return um, all of the multiple rows for, um, those values of taken that have more than two rows associated with them. So this is an example of, of a subquery, combining with a subquery. And then something else which we won't get into at all is that um, in trying to write SQL queries, it can be important to try and optimize the speed because these are typically done in a high performance environment where you want um, a lot of performance to try and deal with a high volume of queries. So we can speed it up um, by using something called join. So I'm, I'm talking about combining tables together, or in this case, I combine the results of the subquery. This is our same subquery, but it's actually faster to use something called a join. And with a join, we combine the survey table with a different table, which is returned by this query. So don't worry about this sequence just yet. This is just to show that it gives you the same value. So now we've come to the end of this first work, um, this, this first notebook. We've um, introduced the topic of joins. So I'm going to flip over to the slides again. Um, before I do that, are there any questions? I'm going to pause if, if there are any questions about the queries I've been talking about, besides on the joins. Um, can you explain again the difference between, uh, wait, where is it? The one that has a group by taken having count of bigger than two and the one that has the word taken in and the parentheses? Yeah, like the difference between that one and the, yes, those two, the, the, the difference between those two. 
You, you mean between this one and the one with join? Or between this one and, and uh, say this one? Yeah, that one. So in this case, well, let, let's, let's see what the result of this particular query is. This one has um, select, if, if I just do select taken from survey, group by taken having count greater than two, it, re it returns just these values of taken. So say I simplified this, so I said select star from survey where taken in and and then I, I list these these values. This is essentially like what the um, the subquery is filling in for me when I specify that thing inside of parentheses. Um, and then I probably have to specify. Oops. When I when I don't do that when I just do something like this. Um, there's an ambiguity here of what the asterisk is um, representing. So when, when I say asterisk here, this, this asterisk isn't representing all of the rows in the original table, it's returning all of the rows in the table which has the group applied to it. So whereas in this case, in, in this case, there's, um, there's no group in, in the outside. There's, there's no group by here. The group by is only applied inside of the subquery. On the outside, there's no group by. So this star refers to all the rows of the table. In this, uh, in this particular one, there is a group by. And this star refers to all of the rows that are returned by the group by not all of the rows of the survey table. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me flip. We don't have a whole lot of time. So um, I'm going to introduce the joins and then um, we'll do something really quick with the beaver since I think it'll just be good for you to, to look at that. Um, as, can one of you please confirm, do you see my slides? Yep, all good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned before on my slides that rows can have the unique identifier and that these can be used to establish relations between tables. So in the case of the, the students and the classes, we had the class ID number, which is associated both with the name of the class and with the, the class that the student was enrolled in. You can use those to, to establish relations between tables. This, this allows you to, to avoid the data storage overhead, say of having all of your data clumped together in one large table so you can use these to establish relations between other tables. You can also use it to establish a relation between one table and itself, or with the result table, say if a query or a subquery, or between um, two different queries, which both return tables. Or you can even use it to, re to um, combine data from one database and a table in a different database. So I didn't talk about this, but or I didn't show an example of this, but you can connect to multiple databases at once. We've only been looking at one, one database when we've been interacting with this. I mean, one, one database at a time, but you can connect to multiple ones. So um, this is, these are the two tables that we started with. There are different ways that you can try and combine the information between these. And it has, has to do with um, how you combine sets. So say you only want to look at the, 
the IDs that both tables have. So that's um, called an inner join. And on an inner join, you, you use the identification number and you include records from both tables where the values match. In some cases, like in this case, the student table has a student which doesn't match with any classes. And the class table has a class that doesn't match with any students. So it's possible to have IDs that don't overlap, even if um, a certain subset of them do. For the left join, you include all the records from the first data set, even if there aren't any matches in the second. And for the right, it's vice versa. So you include all the results from the second set, even if there are no matches in the first. So I'll, I'll give examples of these with the classes and the students shortly. And then with the outer join, you include all records from both, even if there aren't any matches in either one. So as an example, the inner join, the inner join only um, combines rows for which there are matches in both tables. So in this case, there's only a match with the one and with the two, but not the three and the four. So in the table that's returned by this, you only include the one, the students and the classes which have the one and the two for the class ID. And the, the syntax for this, you say select star from students, that returns all of the columns and rows for students. And then you say inner join, and then the name of the second table, which in this case is classes. And then using this another SQL keyword, and um, this relies on the fact that the column in both tables has the same, the same um, name to it, class ID. It is um, possible that those columns won't have the same ID. So typically, or maybe um, just as or more commonly, it's written as um, joining these two tables on a condition. So if you want to join the students table with the classes table, doing an inner join, you can join it on the condition that this, this is the name of the table with a dot and then the title for the column. So the students dot class ID is are these values. You want the um, the condition where these values are equal to these values, or classes dot class ID. And if you do select star, that will return two columns, one of which represents uh, the result from this, say the the table the first table, and one which was, represents the column from the second. If you don't want that, you can be more specific, we showed how to be more specific about the columns specifically that it returns. Um, uh, Rich, for, you, for your question, perhaps some of these explanations will get to this, but the... There, there are different types of unions, certainly, than what it is that I'm talking about. Um, although you do have to have some information. To some extent, you have to have some information in common. But if you don't have any columns that you want to combine, you can say, still combine one row with all of the column, all of the rows, the second row with all of the rows, the third one with all of the rows. You can do kind of an, a much more extensive outer join like that. Um, for the for the inner join, this um, is another way you might see the inner join written. You use an ab abbreviation to refer to each of the tables. So what this says is for, for any of the conditions or say for any of the other um, statements that are used inside of the SQL query, you can use S and C in this particular case to refer to the students in the classes table. So in this case, um, you use s to refer to students, so it's s dot class ID is equal to the classes dot class ID. This is another inner join. For the left join, the left join students is the first table, so this is considered the left, and this is considered the right. 
For the left join, you use all of the rows here, regardless of whether they have matching values inside of the classes table. So all of the rows of the students table are included, um, but not all of the rows from the classes table are included. So the three with, for Phys 100 is not included here. For the right join, it's vice versa. So in this case, all of the rows for the left table, for the right table are included one, two, and three, but not all of the students are included. Only those ones which match at least one of the rows in the right table are included. And just as a caveat, SQLite doesn't have a right join, nor does it have a, a full outer join. So with outer join, you include all of the rows from both tables, regardless of whether there's a match. When there's a match, you match them up. So for one and two, they can be matched, but for four and three, they can't, but they're still included in the result. So that's, that's an outer join. Um, yes, there's a question, can't you do a right join by just switching the order? And the answer is yes. So for SQLite, you can do a right join just by flipping the order of what would otherwise be the left join. And you can also do an outer join in SQLite, even though you can't, there's no syntax for it because you can do, you can do it with a union where you do a union of a left join with essentially like with the right join only on those values where the right join returns null. Um, Uh, so I've gotten into a little in idiosyncrasies with SQLite. It's definitely worth mentioning in this class that there are a variety of um, relational database management systems that you'll get, that you may come into contact with. SQLite is very lightweight. As I mentioned, it's unique in that it doesn't connect to a database server. Um, so in a sense, it doesn't require configuration and the database is stored entirely in a single file to one database. Some other common ones that you might come across, uh, Oracle is very widely used. There's DB2 for IBM. PostgreSQL, MySQL, and MariaDB are open source ones. Um, and then Microsoft has a version as well. Um, and of course, there are many others as well. There are also multiple ways to use or to try and execute SQL to query a database. Um, so in addition to have a variety of relational database management systems, I've showed you using SQLite at the command line. Um, this is a very spare environment um, where if you like entering text commands, it can be very fast depending on how proficient you are at using it. There are also a variety of application programs with graphical user interfaces. So um, that, for, for example, can be very handy um, depending on how complex the data is that you're interacting with. Um, so we'll look at this in just a second. And then um, many languages have interfaces to these um, databases and allow you to execute SQL queries against them so there are SQL, SQL packages for interacting with SQL with Python and R um, and et cetera. Um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, is, is, um, is CSV a standard file type for a table? Um, not necessarily. Um, CSV is just kind of a standard way to represent data in kind of a spare text file format, but data doesn't have to be specified inside of the CSV. And the table itself is stored inside of the database file. Um, Gino, uh, why don't we talk uh, afterwards about that? Um, so, Yes, dbeaver. There's a question about dbeaver. So that's that's what we're coming to here. So we're going to try this out. dbeaver is an application program with a graphical user interface. Uh, there's a question: Does SQLite have some kind of spatial implementation, like 
um, Postgres. Uh, so, um, not that I know of, although I haven't worked a lot with, with spatial data. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to that, Yo, or if um, that's something else to query offline. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but Google says there's something called spatial light. <laughs> uh, spatial light. Um, that's the way to go. PostgreSQL is the is the one that a lot of GIS specialists uh, specialists use. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so we're going to act. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I do want to show you DBver. So what I want you to do is just come back for a second to the Jupyter or to, to wherever you're interacting with the files. Select the one called chinook.db, and then um, uh, you can download it. On my case, I do a right click and download. Um, so that, that this will download it into my files. <clears throat> and I'm gonna start sharing I'm going to open up my dbeaver program on my computer. So if you have dbeaver, open up yours as well. Or, or you can just watch me. Um, so it'll <clears throat> just be a second here while I start it up. Okay, so I'm not sure how well we'll be able to, to do this since everybody's interacting on their own system. But um, the, the database does have to be on your local computer. Um, at least I think so. I haven't tried to investigate a way to connect to it on the Jupyter Hub. So um, what I'd like you to do when you have it open is come up to file and say new. See how much stuff is running on my computer now. Um, and then say a new database project. Um, and you can give it whatever name you want. I'm just going to call it um, SQL class. Hey, Ben, uh, your screen is not showing. Not sharing. Let me see. I think it's only showing the, um, the main dbeaver window, but not the. Oh, it's not showing the sub windows? Exactly, yeah. Try sharing your whole desktop if you. Oh, if that's yeah. Okay. That, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, can, can you see the whole window now? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so, let me do this again then. So, come up to file and new. Uh, if it's asking which wizard to use, if you see something that says SQLite, choose that one. Um, otherwise, um, that may be an installation thing, and we could we could walk you through it after the class if you're interested. So when I say new, okay. So Serena says, yeah, you can see in the chat. So new, I'm going to select database project under dbeaver. I'll say next. And this um, is what I said you could name anything. So I'll call it class v1 because I already created the SQL class. And then if I click on the little arrow next to it, there are a variety of things. We obviously won't get to many of these. But I'll, I'll click on connections. And what I want to do is create a new connection. So a connection is a way to, um, to, to establish an interaction with the database. And we're just going to 
establish the interaction, the Chinook.db is a SQLite database that I made available in that repository of files. So it's, it's the SQLite. Here you can see the other varieties of, that I was mentioning for um, the database management systems. And then when you get to this window, choose browse, and then go to wherever it was on your computer that you downloaded Chinook. Chinook, by the way, is a name for wind. So this is, um, this is a common kind of example database when you're learning about databases. So I, I chose Chinook and then I'll say finish. And then I can click on the little arrow next to it, along with tables. And if, if you've gotten to this now, we're connected to a SQLite database. And we're using this kind of file menu like thing to look at the tables that are inside of the database that we're connected to. So now, now this has, um, what about 10 or 11 tables? If you double click on one of them, it will open something in this larger space, which will allow you to look at the, um, the particular table values. So say I double click on albums. Now it, it opens up uh, additional windows. The first one that I see, I'm not sure if this will be true for you, but the one that's called properties. So the property shows me the columns. It shows me the data types for the column, the lengths, whether it's not null. Uh, we haven't gotten to some of these other things. Actually, so there's quite a lot to SQL well yet to learn, um, clearly. If you look at the data table, uh, the, the data tab, the data tab will show you the values that are inside of this table. So there's an album ID, there's a title, and there's an artist ID. And then I'll look at the, the ER diagram. So we're gonna look at the ER diagram as a way to look at what the relationship is between all of these different tables. So if I, if I come back over here on the left, um, I can drag each of these out into the space to add them to the view. And what, what it's gonna show me is relationships that have already been specified inside of the database that exists between the tables. I'm just gonna drag them all out. So this is just a way to start organizing our mind about how the data is connected together. And I see a, a lot of them are connected to tracks. So I'm gonna put tracks in the center and then I'm just gonna organize them. I'm gonna organize them around this so I get a better idea of the relationships without all of these lines going all over the place. So albums, albums is related to tracks, genres is related to tracks, playlist is related to tracks, um, media type, is also related to tracks. You can see there's a lot of tracks. Playlist is only associated with playlist track. And then tracks are related to invoices. All right, so, so here's, here's our, a slightly cleaned up view of what the tables are. Having a graphical user interface like this makes it a lot easier to visualize what the relationship is between the data that's stored in the database tables. So, because here you can see when you're doing the joins, when you're trying to connect information between different tables, you might have to work through the relationships between a couple, couple different tables before you achieve, say, the information that it is that you want to retrieve. The tracks is relatively well centralized. Um, 
there's there's a half of this that relates more to the music side of it and there's a half of it that relates more to the invoice side of it so these the information that's contained here is music information for tracks and then the tracks can be purchased the invoices return information for example like the unit price and etc so if it won't let you drag drag the tracks um let's let's address that and in, in just a little bit once the class is ends so i just want to show you i want to show you something something else in addition to this i've included a file if you go back to your web tab in addition to chinip.db um I included uh, here, Intro to SQL Part 2. This is a .sql script. So if you also download this, I may be going through this a little fast, but that's just in the interest of finishing this up. Um, I can come back here. If I click on the um, SQL editor, I wanted the SQL editor is what's used to um, execute queries against the data. And then once I'm inside of this, I come back up to the SQL editor and I can import a SQL script, which is how I get access to what I've downloaded. Intro to SQL part two. So I can go th through this and more information for those of you who want to stay after time. But inside of the SQL script, I've already included some ready-made SQL queries for you to execute against this. So this is kind of a Windows-like Windows, Windows -like environment where it's helpful to visualize all of the tables on the right, while I also have another window open where I'm executing queries. And I can execute these queries by clicking on this little arrow button or on my computer, I hit control enter and control enter will execute whatever query it is that I have selected. And then the results are visualized in the bottom window. So here I just selected all of the information from albums. This first set of SQL queries, if you want to work through it, you can just keep on doing control and enter. What I was doing is I was tracking through information about this album or this track called Plays Metallica by Four Cellos, which I found kind of uh, intriguing. And the third query, what you see is trying to track through joins on various tables. So I've connect the albums table. I've joined it with the tracks table using the album ID, and I've joined it with the genres table using the genre ID, which is common in both genres and tracks. And I've done a query where I want the title to be like, to contain this cellos word. So in this case, what I was looking for was the genre of music that corresponds to this particular title, which is metal. And then I also wanted to look um, at um, just to get the distinct values. And then if you track through this, this next one, um, we're looking at the name and composers for the tracks. And we're going to match it up with media types. So there are only five five media types here. There are different types of audio files, or protected files, and purchased files. And I was curious about who actually purchased these AAC audio files. So the first query has the condition MT media type is equal to four, which is this purchased audio type. And it looks at the particular tracks, which have that as a media type. 
So for that particular media type, it looks like it's mainly classical music. But I don't recognize war pigs, which is something different. So in the next query, I wanted to get the composer, um, the composer didn't get me any information, but I did get the genre name, which is alternative. So for the question, how do I import the query file? Come up to SQL editor. <clears throat> you may have to make a new SQL query, new SQL editor window, but then you can come down to import SQL script and that will allow you to import the file from your computer. So getting back to the query, this will be our last, last thing of the session. So I've gotten the composer and genre name. Um, and for this particular query, what I wanted to get was the name of the, the, um, if you, if you track through these, <laughs> when you come up, you can see it doesn't take long before the SQL queries gets a, a little more complicated, particularly if you're dealing with lots of tables. So I have the media type that I want which is the pur purchased AAC audio files, which correspond to media type ideas for. And then, um, so I, I start with that. Here, here's my track. I want, I want the name of the composer from the track. I want it only for the media types where media type ID is equal to four. And then I combine it um, with the genre ID to get the type, the name of the genre. And I also combine it first with albums and then with artist ID because I want to get the artist. But I, can, I can't combine tracks directly to artists. I first have to combine it with albums and then with the artists. So I join it first on the album ID and then second on the artist ID. And this, this allows me to get the artist name, which is Cake. So Cake is the artist name for this particular track, which intrigued me because it was so different from all the rest of the classical tracks. And then I, then I wanted to get the, the count star here. I'm grouping by the genre name. So for, for all of this, this kind of massive query, I get the count of the tracks, which were purchased AAC audio files for each of the genres. So there were six purchased AAC audio files that were classical and one that was alternative. Um, so we've, we've come to the end here. Um, I'm happy to, to hang around a, a, a little longer. If people want to get a, a little more info or for me to introduce this a little more, but um, this is kind of a whirlwind introduction to dealing with a database, which has a lot more tables and on which you can use inner joins or just joins in general to get, to extract data from tables that are related like this. Um, so that's the end of the class. I'm going to turn off the record. Um,